It's from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter, the first 12 verses. This is the voice of John the Baptist calling all that would hear to the Advent promise that Jesus comes and it's time to prepare. Listen carefully to John's call to repentance. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. With the shaft, he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. Well, you're never too old to learn something new. Growing up in Texas, I was told that Jesus wore Tony Lama cowboy boots made in El Paso, Texas with a number seven riding heel. And today I learned he actually wore sandals. It's good to come to church. We don't really expect it in Advent. We don't expect a tone of judgment in the midst of the preparation for this season. We're on a roll here on the downhill slide. We've seen Black Friday and survived to tell the story. Our lists are getting smaller. Preparations are getting closer to be finished. We're ready for Christmas carols and for family to come and to dig into those baked goods that we've stored in the freezer. We're ready. We don't expect in the midst of that some conversation about axes on the cutting floor and the wheat and the shaft and reminders to repent and notes of judgment. It's Advent. Let us complete our preparations. And then we're hit in the face with a couple of passages that remind us that change is a coming. And not only are things expected to change, we're expected to change along with those things. It's the Advent expectation that maybe we're not prepared for. Of all the things that God asks us to do, perhaps the most difficult one is to change. And yet God asks us to do it over and over and over again. But let's be honest, it is very difficult for most of us to create and to sustain a lasting change. Hard to keep the diet going more than a month. Hard to change our attitude and wake up in the morning in a way different than we have before for very long. Hard to create a change that is lasting, that is us, that becomes the source of our being. Change that we hope might bring us closer to God by us becoming more the way God intended us to be, 
hard to create that change too. And yet, that's the change that God sends Jesus to bring. That's what this Advent preparation is all about. It's difficult to pull it off, but surely that is the Christian challenge. To be transformed by trust in the power of God that we might be more who God created us to be in the first place. And that kind of change is difficult, and sometimes we fail on our way to making it. In fact, many of us loathe to even try to make those kinds of changes because the work seems too hard, the time too consuming. We live in a in a if it ain't broke don't fix it world and as long as we can convince ourselves that it ain't broke or convince ourselves that somebody else broke it then we don't have to worry too much about it we're off the hook when i was a kid at the end of every worship service we sang the same benediction lord dismiss us with thy blessing And I learned the words by heart, and I knew that I had them right. I have to prompt myself a little today, but the words of this, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Fill our hearts with joy and peace. Let us eat your love-possessing triumph in redeeming grace. Holy fishes, holy fishes, traveling through this wilderness. That made sense to me. I sang it that way every Sunday for a long, long time. And then I learned as an adult that there's no mention of holy fishes. And Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Nowhere. The words are, oh, refresh us, oh, refresh us. But when you're a small kid and there's not too many folks singing and not many of them doing it very well about you, holy fishes sounded good to me. But even knowing that I was wrong, the change was hard to make. And besides that, holy fishes sounds a lot more exciting than oh, refresh us, oh, refresh us. And I still to this day have a hard time singing that song the correct way. It's hard to unlearn what we learned as children. And we learned a lot of things as small children. We learned that wolves and lions don't lie down together. And we learned that children have got absolutely no place anywhere near either of those animals. We learned that cows and bears don't graze together and that no self-respecting lion would ever eat straw like an ox. And God knows there's never been a child that should be playing around the snake's den. There's no such place. It's as ludicrous to us as the thought of someone beating their swords into plowshares. It just doesn't happen because that's not the way we learned it. And that's not what we expect. It's like the great philosopher Woody Allen said, the lamb may lie down with the lion, but he's not going to get much sleep. (laughs) And yet Isaiah, in all good confidence, proclaims without any fear that one day this will happen. One day this change will take place. One day what I speak of will be reality for all of us to see that there really will be a time when this will happen. That what God brings in the advent of his son is change, that things will be different now and different in a big way, and not only will the world about us be changed, but we ourselves will be changed because of it. That's why he comes in the first place. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene in that same mold of the Old Testament prophets, dressed in sandals and camel hair, eating locusts and wild honey, proclaiming something new and different even while he looks old and unusual. One is coming who will bring change. And John says over and over, repent, repent, turn, change. Be transformed yourselves. One is coming, he cries in the wilderness now, but anyone who listens can hear him. And he promises change. The crooked paths will be made straight. The pathway to God will be made straight right through this child who comes, Jesus Christ. And it will change our reality. He will come and he will change. 
he will change the world about us. And John makes it very clear. The point of the Christian faith is not for us to become good church members. The point of the Christian faith is that we might be transformed by God so that we might become what God created us to be in the first place. The Sadducees and the Pharisees come for baptism. They are wonderful church members. They have mastered the art of institutional religion. They know the rules by heart and they follow them to the T. They do what they're told to do. And yet John looks up and sees them coming and says, you don't know that change is around the corner and you don't know how in your own lives to make that change reality. You brood of vipers, he calls them. The point of our Christian faith is not to become good church members. It's to become good Christians who are transformed by the love of God and learn to mimic the life of Christ. John calls out the Sadducees and Pharisees in no uncertain terms, and he calls for them, too, to be transformed by this love of God and not to rely on their lineage, to think they've got it. He believes as fully as Isaiah that this thing will happen and that we will be changed by it, and by the situation of our very lives, we will be changed.